Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. I hope we're all doing well. And I hope you've had a, a wonderful week. We bless God for another time in his presence. Um, and we thank God for tonight's service. Um, again, we, we are praying that it will be a wonderful time of, of learning and, you know, building ourselves. as the body of Christ. And uh, I will start with an opening prayer and then we'll take it from there. So can we just uh, just thank God for tonight, thank him for all that he has done. He has been faithful to us. We are grateful unto you, our Father. We just bless and exalt you. We thank you for the opportunity that you have given to us, Lord, to come before your presence. We thank you for strength. We thank you for your grace. We thank you, oh God, for the week that we have had. We thank you for all of the journey mercies. We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for our homes. We thank you for our, our, um, our jobs, businesses, everything that you have given to us, Lord. The Bible says that every good thing and perfect thing comes from from the Lord, and we thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for giving us these things. We thank you for never leaving us, nor forsaking us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for, for dwelling with us tonight. We say glory and honor be unto your name, in Jesus' name. We humble ourselves before you tonight. We pray that you forgive our sins, O oh God, in whichever way we may have sin against you, sin of omission, sin of, sin of commission, Lord, we pray for your forgiveness. We ask for your strength, O oh God. We ask for your grace. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you will lead us, you will direct us. We pray that your light will shine in us, through us, in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Father Lord, that tonight, even as we, 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 we continue in this service, we pray that, Lord, our lives will never remain the same in the name of Jesus. We pray that you open our hearts to receive Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you open our hearts, oh God, even to hear what you have for us through your through your 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 your, your daughter and the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you give us the grace, oh God, even not just to hear this, but also to be a doer in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way tonight. Touch every life that comes into this, it comes into, into contact. with this service in the mighty name of Jesus. We bless and exalt your holy name. We give you glory and honor. We say, take control, Lord. Take control of this service tonight. Blessed be your name forevermore. For in Jesus' most mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Just want to praise you, Lord. Lead my hands to say, I love.
gonna praise you this morning and I lift my hands to say I love you Jesus for you Can everyone hear me, please? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say a big welcome to everyone who has joined us um for today's Friday service. And um we're going, we're having a very special program and uh, it's a special topic. We have a guest minister in our midst coming to talk to us about personal and professional etiquette for life. I'm just here to to read um to read um, the profile of our guest minister for today. Our guest minister is Dr. Nike Adebajo. Adebajo, better me. Dr. Nike Adebajo is is an associate minister at King Center in Sheffield, where she is also the coordinator of Empower, a citywide prayer network and co instigator of Sheffield Leaders in Prayer. For many years, Nike ran a diversity training and development consultancy in South Yorkshire, having worked in policy and management positions in borough and city councils, councils as well as in the, in the voluntary sector in the UK. She was a university lecturer in Nigeria before moving to the UK over 30 years ago. She served as National Women's Coordinator within the Overseas Fellowship of Nigerian Christians and is a trustee of several organizations. Her PhD is in social linguistics and she also holds a graduate diploma in theology ministry 
and missions. She's married to Ade, and they, they have grown up children. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please kindly help make welcome our guest minister for today, Dr. Nike Adebajo. Thank you for having us, Ma. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Uh, it is a, a joy and a, a privilege to be among you today and uh, to share with you something that's really on my heart. Um, I This is a, a course I developed after having myself been in the UK for a while and through my own experiences, recognized the many differences between the cultures, uh, both the culture that we come from and the culture within which we are. And this really, I feel is really helpful for most people coming to live in the UK to have an opportunity to just talk through things like this and pick up new things, pick up ideas. And um, if we were face to face, we will have lots of conversations as well, but we'll see how we can get on, um, on Zoom. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen and uh, hopefully it works like it did uh, when we tried this out. Fabulous. Does everybody see the screen? Not two screens. Can you see one or two? We can see the screen, Mark. We can Fantastic. see one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, just a little bit about myself. I mean, you've read that. To be honest, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. These are my degrees. You've heard that. Um, I came to live in the UK in 1987. Can someone just help me tell me how long ago that was? <laughs> my maths is not very good. 37. 37 years ago. There we go. So I've lived in the UK for 37 years. Um, yeah, and I've had lots of opportunities to connect with people and to, um, yeah. So can I ask, please unmute yourself and tell me what you think this sign means, anybody? Somebody? It means okay. Uh, okay, so it means okay. That's interesting because yes, it means okay, but it doesn't only mean okay. There we go. Can you see that in different countries, it means different things? Can you all see that? Somebody talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can see that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And some of you who are from Nigeria, the part of Nigeria I come from, if somebody does this to you, they're not saying take five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they're not saying take five. <laughs> So you've got to be careful where you use that signal, for example. Ooh. Exactly. So that's an example as well. So that's just to show you how so varied this whole thing about um, the etiquette of a particular nation or country or people is. So this is what I'm hoping we'll do tonight. We're going to talk about what is etiquette. We're going to talk about cultural intelligence, because that's a very important part of choosing to work at other people people's culture is a sign that you have cultural intelligence. We're going to talk about general etiquette. We're going to look about communication etiquette, workplace etiquette, but I don't think we'll have enough time to look at table manners. But if we do, fine. If we don't, that, that may be the bit that we're not able to get through today. So what is etiquette? The dictionary defines it as the customs or rules that govern behavior that's regarded as correct or acceptable in social or physical life. So that's what it is. Generally, it's what people regard as acceptable. You are either in doing what is acceptable or you're not doing what is acceptable. Sometimes there are gray areas and sometimes people can be generous to you. They know that you're new to the particular context. They might say, oh, well, I know why they're behaving like that. It's because they're new. But sometimes people, maybe if you've been around for a while, think, well, you've been around for a while, surely you ought to now know that in this particular culture, certain things apply. And before we go into, because we, we, we're here within a church context, you're having a, a fellowship. I just wanted to, you to be aware that this is very scriptural. I like to help people recognize that there are many, many, many people in scripture who lived cross-culturally, and these are just a few of them. We know that Moses did. Number one, although he lived in Egypt, he was first born on the other side of the fence, if you like, he was born um, in the Jewish quarters and then his mother tried to save him. He ended up in the um, Egyptian quarters and then in the end, he actually had to flee Egypt and go and leave, live amongst the Midianites. 
which again is a totally different culture. So that's an example of somebody who had to learn to live cross-culturally. Same as Joseph in the Bible, we know that Joseph started life off in a place and then he ended up being sold into uh, slavery, into captivity as well. So those are examples of people who have lived cross-culturally um, in, in, in scripture. The people who do that all the time. Um, Ruth is another example. We know that Ruth herself um, was a Moabitess. And then when she decided that I want to follow my mother-in-law, she ended up coming to live amongst God's people, the Jewish people. And what happened with Ruth is she had to learn. She had to let someone teach her the culture. She had to let Naomi teach her what, how, what does it mean when you go and lie down next to someone and you ask them to cover you with their, 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 uh, their, their duvet? What does it mean? She wouldn't have known that because that was not a Moabite um, tradition, but she had to learn what that meant. Same as Daniel. I mean, there's so many examples in scripture. I've only just given you four. But we also need to remember that Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, also, for a time, crossed over and went to live in Egypt. So what we are doing coming to live in another nation isn't strange at all in scripture. And it's a good thing to look at how scripture handles this. For example, you know that Joseph, he kept what he knew was sacred to him. So he didn't, uh, uh, Daniel, sorry, kept what he knew was sacred to him. Daniel said, I will not defile myself to eat from the king's table. So he knew that because he knew that the food was sacrificed to idol. But beyond that, he learned the culture of the times. So if he was speaking to the king, he would speak in a way that was right for the king. He would say, oh, king, live forever. You know, he wouldn't say, well, um, I'm Jewish and I know that only our Lord and our God is eternal. Nobody else is. He he followed through with the, the, the parts of the culture of the country that did not conflict with his faith. So I hope that helps everybody to recognize that there's certainly scriptural reasons for doing this. So I need to also say this that whenever we talk about British etiquette, this is not, this is about difference, not that one is better. And I know that I sometimes fall into that trap myself. And I think some element of my culture is better. You know, we're all humans. We all like to think, oh, I love the way that Nigerian people respect each other. That doesn't happen in the UK. Maybe Nigerian culture is better. Actually, it's really best for you to approach this more from the standpoint of difference. And also to recognize that although I'll be sharing different etiquettes with you today, all of British etiquette is not the same. It's not homogeneous at all. There are differences in British culture. And if there's any, any element of that we come to today, uh, I'll, sh I'll share that with you where there is difference. Then I said, we're going to talk about cultural intelligence and this is really important. And many of you, um, you know, I don't know how long you've you've lived in the UK. I don't know where you are with your career, but actually, in many many careers now, people are looking for those who can demonstrate cultural intelligence. People who understand that different cultures present differently, especially if you're working in a multinational company, they want to see that you're aware of those, and it means that you're able to avoid pitfalls in communication, for example. And then when you're collaborating, you know, one of my children constantly is ringing in, in, in calls with other parts of the world. And they've had to understand some of the cultural implications of that uh, because that's just how their work is. And this notion of cultural intelligence, I said, is used in business. If you want to work in the military, it's used there too. And one other thing they now do actually is that they have some way of measuring what they call, you know, like normally we'll measure IQ, they also now can measure cultural quotient. And sometimes that is used in terms of when they're trying to appoint people, they use that um, measure of cultural quotient to do that. So I wanna start with a bit of general etiquette and just talk through what, uh, and some of this, some of you might already have picked up. Uh, if you've lived in the UK and it's six months, I always encourage people not to do this seminar until they've been in the UK for a while, because some of it may mean nothing unless you've started to experience what UK life is like, you know, my six six months uh, are thereabout. This is one of the biggest, biggest problems for us who come from other parts of the world, particularly Nigeria. I'm going to assume, because most of the names I saw as we started felt like they were Nigerian names. I might be wrong, um, but Nigerians, we're not known for being punctual. 
And um, I have to tell you that that is a big deal in the UK. And you can see that says better three hours too soon than a minute too late. That's an exaggeration, to be honest. Sometimes people give you like a leeway of up to about five minutes. But if you're much later than that, the best thing you need to do is to make sure you contact them well. And once you know you're going to be late, like if you know an hour ahead, you're going to be late. Just say, I'm sorry, I'm running, you know, 15 minutes late, 20 minutes late. Then people are actually at that point think, well, yeah, you're valuing them. The thing that people don't like about punctuality, about people who are not punctual, is that you're trying to say that your time matters more than their time. So if they've been waiting for you, you have an appointment at six o'clock and a typical Nigerian would say it's around six o'clock. But actually, if you ever look at when UK people give you a time, they say meet at. And at is a, such a specific pronoun. Around, you know, you can say that when I'm doing using my hand, that's what around means. At is specific. So when people tell you at, they really mean that. I have known people who, rather than be late somewhere, they actually do a recce first, if it's an important place they're going. They first have an idea, go around there at a time that's, you know, not pressured for them, and they work out what it would, how long it'll take them. Some people arrive and sit outside and wait until the exact time and then knock on your door, bang on the six o'clock. But as I said, you know, there's a bit of a leeway up to about five minutes is fine. Um, now, this notion of personal space, I have to say, all the years I grew up in Nigeria, I never really understood there's anything such as personal space, you know, but we, because we don't even have a phrase for it. We don't have a terminology for personal space, but UK has. And personal space is, just as it says there, is about an arm's length. And you can see from that picture at the bottom, that is someone in the workplace over-familiarizing themselves, invading someone else's personal space. They are not aware that they're doing, but you can look at the face of the person whose space they're invading. It's really important that you avoid doing that, especially men, if you're a man and on I this... If you're a man on this call and you're talking about connecting with another woman, with a woman, especially that, you've got to be really careful because it's it's such a thin a, 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 a thin line between someone saying you're invading their personal space or someone even saying that they want to kind of raise an issue around sexual harassment. And I really need to say that, especially if you're in the workplace, you really need to be careful that you don't touch somebody else's physical body unless they've given you permission to do that people have gotten into trouble with this so i need to let you know that that people who had no idea they thought they were being friendly but actually other people took uh to read it completely differently and ended up going to their line manager and complaining about them that they have been touching them inappropriately so don't touch anybody and if you're in the church context like in our church we pray for people but we always ask, can I put my hand on your shoulders? And it's always the shoulder because that's pretty kind of like innocuous. But you can tell that this person is putting their hand on their shoulder, but across the body of the woman, not not, not from the side. In other words, if you're looking at that picture, if the, if the man was touching the right shoulder of that woman, it might not have felt so bad. But because he's actually reaching across her, and then touching her left shoulder, that makes it even worse. So it's important that you're aware of that. Oh, queuing. We know that the UK people are known for queuing. And this, if you join this queue, you'll know exactly where you stand because you go to the back of the line. And it's because everybody is first come, first served. But what about if you came here at this bus stop and you saw this? Where is the queue? But I can assure you, everybody who is there knows who came there before them. And if you were to, the bus came and then you barged your way to the front, that would be taken as being rude. And one off is fine. You know, if you went visiting somewhere, I know in London, Edgeware, and you did that and they never see you again, that's fine. But if you do that all the time near where you live, then it means your neighbours will start to get an impression about you that this is this person who is always never waits their turn, who never queues up, who always jumps the, the, the line. And so that's when it becomes a problem, when you're doing it repeatedly in a place where you may be well known and therefore people start to form opinions about you that maybe are not right. I have no way for word. I don't know that 
English people have a word for what I call hacking. You know that thing that we do that there's something stuck at the back of your throat and then you're trying to bring up the phlegm and you make that wonderful noise and you do that in public. Um, you may catch the odd person in the UK doing that, but I can assure you that they will not be people of your ilk. They, will, they may be people who, you know, I'm sorry to say, maybe they've just never been, you know, schooled in the thing about etiquette. And there are, of course, people in the UK who are like that. But most people who are of the ilk of those of you on this call today will never be caught doing that kind of thing. For example, you'll never catch uh, the king of England doing that. Oh, you never catch them doing that. Um, and spitting, I know I see, I, I watch football and I see footballers doing that. But apart from them, it's just something that people just generally don't do. If you're going to do that, find a handkerchief. I clean my nose, everybody does that. And I find a tissue, find myself a quiet space and do that or blow into, into a handkerchief, but not in the middle of the road. You are sticking your finger up your nose. And then when you've done that, what do you do with that finger again? So those things are kind of, from the point of view of etiquette, that's a no-no. And of course, we all now know to cover our mouths when we sneeze or cough, because we've all been through COVID. And I actually don't like people covering their hands with their mouth anymore, because I've learned a better way that we're all taught during COVID, and that's into our elbow. Because then that way, those hands are still free of those germs from your throat and your mouth. So anytime you're doing that, I'd just recommend that you cough into your elbow or you sneeze into that. Doors. Uh, it's considered bad manners if someone is walking behind you, but you don't keep the door open for them. Now, I know that there'll be men on this call who will say, oh, you're telling us to do that. I did that for one lady. And then she said, thank you very much. I can do my I can hold the door myself. Honestly, men, I'm really sorry, but I have no way to answer that question for you other than to say etiquette is that if someone is walking behind you, you open the door for them. Um, uh, and yes, and let them go. Um, or, or, yeah, so that's just the etiquette. And if someone does open the door for you, please, please say yes. I uh, Say thank you, by the way. I mean, you don't have to say yes. If you're a woman who feels so super independent, I just tell them nicely in a nice way. Thanks, but I'm, I'm okay. Or don't kind of, you know, look horrified at them. Like, do they think I don't have any hands to do it myself? Uh, etiquette just means you'll be nice and kind to them and say, thank you. Uh, uh, um, I could do it myself. Is that all right so far? I don't know. I can't work out how long we've done, but um, um, we'll come to questions in, in, a, in, a, in a bit. But um, I want to talk to you a little bit now about verbal and non-verbal communication, because that's really important in the UK. OK, I know that many of us from where we come uh, and I count myself as one. Well, the first thing we're talking about is forms of address. You know, if if people uh, from Nigeria talk to me or they can see me that I don't really. Once upon a time, I would have said I look 25, but I'm now pretty honest. I know I no longer look 25. So they quite quickly work out that I'm not 25. They might work out I've probably got my bus pass now. And then they'll say something, but they won't call me by my first name. And they won't do that in, in, in Nigeria because we come from a culture that's an honor culture, a culture where people honor people in terms of their, their age and so on. So we're, we're a culture that appreciates that. But the UK comes from not that kind of culture. And it's not that it's bad, it's just different. They come from what I call an egalitarian culture, a culture that sees nearly everybody as equal. I mean, there's the exception, like, you know, the king and so on, they'll bow before the king, they'll kneel before uh, our late queen, for example. But uh, other people, it's egalitarian. We're all seen on the same level. Um, so that's how it's seen. Um, so in the UK, first names, including for your lecturers, if you're a student, that is important that you use a first name. And I know that is one of the hardest things for students to do uh, or for most people like that to do. They're like, how can I call my lecturer by first name? Well, you have to practice it if you're not quite used to that. Practice calling your lecturer by first name when they're not there and do it. Because if you don't do it and you call them sir or anything else that you would have used back in Nigeria or back from wherever your home country is, uh, other people will think that you're being a sycophant, that you're being sycophantic, you're looking to curry favour from this person. That's why you don't want to call them by their first name. And that's not your reason. You're doing it because you want to be respectful. Other people will think that you're currying their favour. So that's why it's important that you use a first name for anybody 
including lecturers. And I know sometimes if you if you particularly attend, you know, your church, I know whether they it's a predominantly Nigerian church, I expect. But even for people who don't attend a predominantly Nigerian church, um, it's really hard. I have some of my colleagues, uh, ministers in, in the Baptist that I belong to, and they would tell me that if they have Nigerians in their congregation, that they never call them by name. They're always calling them pastor, pastor. And that's fine but it's it, it, it just recognize that that person they're not used to it so you might see that sometimes they bristle or other people listening to you might think oh why are they not calling pastor by their name but you know sometimes it's you, you choose that your culture will pre, your own culture will predominate another but just be aware that when you're doing it it's not the culture of the receiving person so make sure you give them that leeway that that's not their culture so they themselves are trying to adjust to hearing you not use their first name, to hearing you use pastor or, or reverend or whatever it is for them. I have lived in Sheffield since 1994, and these are some of the words that you will hear if you live in Sheffield. I don't know if Manchester is like that. Sheffield, people call you duck, actually, and they don't mean a quack quack. That's just what they do. They call you uh, people petal and flower and even call you a sausage. So be aware, and it's all perfectly positive. So be aware wherever you are based. What are the usual words that people might use there? They're like words of endearment, but used between people who don't know each other well. And it's just how it is in Sheffield. In fact, if people don't call you flower, then you should be a bit worried that it means they're not really thinking that you're part of them. If they start calling you duck and petal and sausage, then it means that they're thinking, yeah, we're in, a, we're in good relationship. So those are, are terms of address. Another thing about communication is, honestly, people say thank you here way more than we do in Nigeria. And I just want to say to you, any opportunity you get to say thank you, please say thank you. You know, if you're on a bus and you come off at your stop, throw a thank you to the driver. And I have seen it before that drivers, if you don't say thank you, the driver themselves will say thank you to you so that you know that you've just not said thank you to them. They're drawing your attention to the fact that you've not said thank you to them. If anybody says thank you to you, your response is you're welcome and you should respond that way. And again, if you're making a request, this is not something we do in Nigeria. We just generally just say, you know, like you're in a restaurant. Um, do, do you want water? Yes. You know, but here, if you say, do you, would you like some water? Then you say, yes, please, as your response. Uh, the fact that they're a waiter or waitress does not mean that the, that egalitarianness that I talked about means that you 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 are expected to say yes, please, not just throw a yes at them. You are expected to say yes, please. Now that doesn't quite stretch to sorry because sorry is the way of, of apologizing to someone for something you have done. And again, that's the difference in Nigeria. Somebody falls over, and says, ah, sorry, oh. Because you'd had nothing to do with it, but you say sorry, oh. Um, but actually in the UK, you only say sorry if you are the reason for what has happened. So uh, I think there might be another slide. Yeah, here's a slide of someone who's fallen. If you met this young child who's fallen or the one falling down the stairs, you don't say, oh, sorry, because you're not the one who pushed them. You just say, oh, 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 you can say, oh, I hope you're all right. Something like that. But you don't say sorry. Sorry is an acceptance that you were in the wrong. So again, if you're driving a vehicle and maybe you're involved in an accident and it's not your fault and maybe the other person looks a bit hurt, don't go to them and say, oh, sorry, because that sorry, they might record it. I mean, not on their phone, they recorded that. That's what you said. And they might say that that's an acceptance that you were in the wrong. So that's a word that I would not use as liberally as please or thank you. Sorry, reserve that for if you've done something wrong. So if you brush past someone and you knock them over, you can say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but if you didn't and you say sorry, sometimes some, some people will even say to you, well, you didn't do anything wrong. So if, if you use that sorry too liberally, you would hear some people tell you, but it wasn't your fault or but you didn't do it. So that's so, for example, you can say if they fell over, you can say, oh, are you okay? So that's a better a better phrase to use than to say sorry. More on verbal communication. Don't brush past someone, just stop and say, excuse me. And they would recognize that that means, can you just step aside so I can um, go through or pass, go past. 
The other thing that people don't like in the UK is interrupting. Now, again, in Nigeria, we would do that because, you know, it's like the survival of the fittest. If you are conversing and you are not holding your space very well, then somebody else can box in and they can then kind of like speak into that. But actually in the UK, um, it's not acceptable to interrupt when other people are speaking. Even if, and I once went for an interview and, um, the, 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 we all the people who were being interviewed were all put in a group together and they watched us they gave us a, an assignment to do and they watched how we would connect with each other and how we responded and they were marking lots of different things they were marking your ideas they're marking all that but one of the things they were also marking was must to being things like interruption because I remember that while I was in that interview I wanted to say something I was the only black person in the interview uh I wanted to say something all of them were talking one after the other talking talking and what I wanted to share, the time had gone. But then what I did was I just said, when there was a lull, I said, sorry, can I just take us back to? So that's a good way to do that. If you feel you're going to miss the time when you can interject or, or be involved, you can always, when there is a, a space and quiet, you can say, can I take you back to? And then say what it was, what time in the conversation and what you wanted to say. So there's a way to still um, have your voice heard but that would have to be not interrupting someone else. And if somebody said, this is one that I find sometimes we, we don't respond to properly. If someone said, would you like a cup of tea? The answer is yes, please. Not yes, thank you. Because it feels logical that you should be able to say yes and thank you. So if, you, if they ask you, would you like a cup of tea? The answer is yes, please. Or it's no, thank you, but not no, please. So just again, be aware of when you use those two together. The thing to realize about the UK is that politeness is not a sign of being servile. You know what I mean by servile, like servitude, like you're a servant, uh, because actually some of us, where we're brought up, uh, it's the lower person, either lower in age, lower in status, that kind of thing, who, who, who expresses things with politeness. And then the person who is older or, or, or higher in status feel like they don't have to be polite. No, don't forget, this is an egalitarian society. All of us are thought. And I know that you, you, know, you might ask me, is it really true? I don't think it's really true, but it's just how people believe it. Because it's not true, because if you're before royalty, you would have to be, you know, not back the royal family at all. You have to always face them. You can't back them, um, turn your back to them. So obviously it's not 100%, but it's a much more egalitarian society. So when you're being polite, it isn't a sign of being servile. It's just a sign of good manners, really, not that you're being servile. Yeah, offering help. Again, don't force your help on other people. Uh, even elderly people want to retain their independence for as long as possible. So unless, if you want to ask them, if you want to offer help, offer. Don't just do it. Just offer it. So can I help you? And if they say no, Honestly, they're not being rude or anything. They just like to keep their independence for as long as possible. Jokes is an area, again, where I feel that sometimes we we, we get it wrong. Um, um, I remember uh, there's, a, there's a story there about a joke. Um, somebody I know, and I know this person, they're a nurse and in their place of work, they thought that they'd got, they were on really good terms with people at work. And then somebody was eating their lunch and they were joking about, oh, they're going to taste their food. They're going to eat their food. And I kid you not, the person didn't take it as a joke and went and reported to a more senior nurse about what had happened. This person was literally only joking. So some of the jokes that we would do and we would accept that is perfectly fine for us doesn't travel across cultures. So I would recommend that you listen more to what kind of jokes travel across culture. British humor is very dry. You know, it's not, I don't know if some of you, I don't know if I'm talking about my age when we used to have Baba Sala on the television. Uh, you would have, you know, really the jokes were, just like, then they're not like the British type of jokes. British jokes are very dry. The wit, it's wit that they're looking for. They're not looking for someone who would just say, I'm going to eat your food. And you say, oh, I was only joking. No, people take those kind of things seriously. So I'd rather err on the side of caution and not, um, not um, have jokes or like tell jokes like that or, or, or joke in such a way with anybody else. This is a really big one. 
I have to say that many of us, uh, and it's not just Nigerians, that there's been some work done among social scientists and they found that people who live in warmer cultures tend to be more exuberant and louder with their voices. And people who live in cooler, colder cultures tend to be quieter. It's just how it is. So when we're here, we need to remember, even if things are really bad, you know, I remember someone telling a story about, um, I think it's someone from, I can't remember whether they were from Northern parts of Africa who lost a loved one. And so they were wailing and shouting and, you know, the pain, they were wailing. And the neighbors went and called the police because that's what, for them, they were counting that as, you know, having some form of um, uh, noise pollution, whereas this person was grieving. In our culture, when we grieve, it's okay to sob out loudly, to weep, to cry. In the UK, if someone is uh, bereaved and has even just heard that they've been bereaved, what does the UK person say? Would you like a cup of tea? You know, that's the cup of tea is the, you know, it solves every problem in the world. You've just been bereaved. The next thing anybody does, would you, cup of, would you like a cup of tea? They're not expecting you to wail. You can even come, I've met people before who have just been bereaved and they're back at work like the next day and you're not finding that. I, 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 I find it hard to understand it, but it's just different because we know how we grieve is different to how they grieve. For generations, they've grieved like that so they're used to that kind of grieving whereas I know that some of my one of my daughters has an Eritrean friend and they actually have a weeping session where they weep for I can't remember how many days it is and after that they've kind of done the weeping so cultures are so different and just being aware of the culture within which we are uh, matters Chris can you tell me how much more time I've got um sorry me so you've got at least um another 20, 25 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. No um, small talk. Now, Nigerians, we don't do small talk. You know, you meet someone, hey, you know, they're wherever you've met your friend's house or whatever, you're just gisting, that's it. It all goes, that's where, even you meet someone at the bus stop, you can start having conversations of all kinds of things. In some parts of the UK, that's okay. I think in Sheffield, we may do that a bit in Sheffield because Sheffield is much more laid back. Yorkshire people are the best. They're amazing. I'm now Yorkshire. I call myself a Yorkshire last now. You know, they're really great. They chat and so on. But some parts of the country, that's not the case. So if you're in Manchester now, you go down to London, you know, get a job and go down to London. People maybe don't do what they tend to do is what you call small talk, which really is safe talk. What is it safe to talk about in the UK? Oh, always, always the weather. You can never be go wrong about the weather. If you meet someone and you don't know what to say, just say, oh, it's been a lovely day today. That's fine. Or you say, oh my goodness, it's been raining for the last three days. That's fine. They will enter a conversation with you about, you know, what the, what the weather is like. And so that's fine. Or you can talk about tomorrow's weather forecast. Oh, they said that it's going to be really warm tomorrow. And say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. And so that's always a safe bet to talk about that. Then the other things that are not safe to talk about, and I'm talking about, you know, some of us here will be in your work context. You have a work do, you go and meet up with your colleagues. Maybe it's teams from different parts of the country. You're all together and you're chatting. It's not okay to talk about, ask people their age. It's not okay to refer to people's weight. I remember when I was growing up, uh, if people were lean, you called them pan uh, la toro, you know, like uh, the uh, stockfish. You know how dry stockfish is very lean that's what people will call people who are uh, slim in, in the uk you don't do things like that you don't say fatty bomba and all those kind of things that we used to say in nigeria those things just don't cut when you're talking to someone in fact some people don't even like you if they're if they're trying to lose weight some people don't even like you talking telling them that they're losing weight some do but some don't because they'll be saying so did you say that i was uh vertically challenged before is that what you're trying to say so people really don't like weight is something that you talk to someone about when you get to know them, not as part of small talk. And you don't talk about money like their salary, like how much they bought their house. If you're interested in how much anybody bought their house, go to Zoopla and find out. But you don't ask them you know, how much. It is. In fact, there's an advert on telly at the moment about a couple who went to see the the guy's grandma, I think it was. And the girl was just saying, oh, this is a lovely house. I wonder how much it is. And the boy was looking at her and saying, don't ask that question. So even an advert is made around that notion that you don't ask people about how much their house costs. I want to talk a little bit about introductions and greetings, what you do when you meet people. 
and how that's different. Um, the first time, it is not acceptable to kiss someone on the cheek. You might see people do it a lot in the UK, but only when they know each other well enough. And that thing I talked about when I talked about personal space, especially in the workplace, keep those kind of things outside the workplace. Hugging, uh, kissing on the cheek, just don't even go there if it's a workplace uh, because you might get into trouble for doing that. And then the other thing that you obviously don't do, unless you're in front of King Charles or members of the royal family, you don't genuflect if that happens in the part of Nigeria you come from, you don't bow, um, because that's just not what people do. If you do that, it's a bit odd and they're like, oh, it's, what are you up to? Um, if anybody offers you a handshake, you must take it because if you don't take it, it's very rude. Uh, they'd say you left their hand hanging and that's actually something that's really bad taste. So if somebody offers you their hand, shake them. But when you shake, it's a firm handshake, uh, not a limp one because they're like, oh, why are you limp? You're shaking my hand limply. And certainly not a fierce one that you squash their hands, but it's just a firm handshake. And if you need to practice that, Practice that with someone else and ask them how it's come across, especially in the workplace. You need to learn how to give a good, firm handshake in, in the workplace because that's counted like somebody who can be trusted. There's something positive about a good handshake and a limp handshake. People just wonder what kind of person is this, you know. So, so when you meet them, we've said what you shouldn't do and what you do. So when we ask, how do you do in Nigeria? People often say, fine, thank you. That's not the correct answer in the UK. If it's a, how do you do? It's a salutation. It's not a question. You salute them back by saying, how do you do? So that's how you respond to each other. How are you? Now, that's a question. Somebody says, how are you? Again, I'd say, depends where you are. If you're in the workplace and they say, how are you? The answer is always, I'm fine. Because fine is not that you're telling a lie. It's there's a phrase, and I've forgotten what it's called in, in, in sociolinguistics, that it's a particular type of, it's like a, it's like the salutation thing, the, the, your answer is scripted and you, you answer in a scripted way. Again, I know a story about a lady, again, this is a story, I think she was doing a nursing degree and um, she was regularly late for class and every time she walked in, how are you? Oh gosh, you know, today, you know, today and this child did this and by the time I dropped them off to school and said, I'm really so sorry I'm late. Da, 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 da. And every time, how are you? There's always a story. In the end, she was taken off the course uh, because you don't have to tell people at work all your problems. Uh, find people in the church that you can connect with and tell them what you're going through. If anybody asks you at work, how are you? You're fine, thank you. Um, because it's just the expected response. They're not asking you to give them the storyline of what happened to you yesterday and why this happened and that one happened. If people keep doing that, you might find people draw away from you because they might see that you are a negative person. It's not that they don't have their problems, but if you ask them how they are, they just say they're fine, thank you, because it's a greeting and that's all there is to it. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about how you have to learn to receive first name as well. We've talked about how you have to learn to give it. You also have to learn how to receive it. So if your you know, a neighbor has a little child and they decide to call you Toby, then that's it. They call you Toby, that's it. That's just how it is. Don't be thinking, ah, this boy is rude. Oh, he's just calling me by my name. Yeah, that's your name. And so they have a right to call you by your name because you give it. You also have to be willing to receive it. I want to say something about um, greetings as well. You know, in, in Nigeria, I lived, I spent a, a year in my NYC in the north and northerners can greet. They're the ones I know that greet a lot. They will just, the yaya will keep going, how are, how are, and they, you know, they, they kneel before each other and greet each other like that. In the UK, it's not like that. You just have to re realize that it's just a hello or a hi. And I want to say to you that even when you have been at, maybe you went out with someone in a group and you sat next to each other yesterday night and you chatted and chatted and maybe at work, they're in a different team. You see them the next day. There's no guarantee that they'll greet you. There is no, absolutely no guarantee at all that they will greet you. And the reason is just that you were there chatting yesterday, their culture is, that doesn't mean that you formed a friendship. Whereas actually many of us back in, at home will think if you spend time with someone like that, surely there is some rapport that's been built and we can build on that. No, it's not the case. Uh, I'll tell you another story. There's a, a doctor who, I know this doctor actually, he 
years and years ago, he would go to the doctor's uh, the doctor's room or I can't remember what they call them. They sat there, you know, and he would meet this um, older consultant and would always say good afternoon. I don't even think he said sir. So at least he dropped the sir and just say good afternoon or good morning, whatever it is. And the person is reading their newspaper and they say good good morning. You know, look over the newspaper and greeting. One day he said good morning. And then the person pulled the newspaper down and said, good morning, good morning, good morning. Give them seven good mornings and said, that's your seven good mornings for the week. In other words, don't greet me again for the next week. So we sometimes overestimate what it means to be cordial. So just be aware of that, that we our own, where we draw the line of cordiality is probably uh, uh, nearer than they would do. They need more connection points before you get to the point where people can think, we can be that cordial. So you don't feel I'm being rude if I don't say hello. You didn't say hello if you just say hello, just that's it. No need to start saying, how's your wife? How's your son? How is her? Unless you know them well. That does, you just say hello and that's it. It's not a requirement to, to be that um, close. I want to talk a little bit now about nonverbal communication. Um, one of it is not to over gesticulate. Some amount of gesticulation is acceptable but over gesticulating, people start to say that uh, they're being aggressive. You are seen as being aggressive. Uh, you're, you're seen as being like, ah, yeah, that becomes aggressive. Uh, whereas a little bit of, you know, like where your hands are not too far away from your body, that's fine. But if it becomes like that, that's being over, over gesticulating. And please, whatever you do, especially when you're talking to someone who is in a more senior position than you are, make eye contact. In the UK, making eye contact, not making eye contact is a sign not of respect. In our, in our culture, I remember if I was being told of when I was young and I was looking at the elder person in the eyes, they, they, I would get more, more verbals for what I was doing, that you were looking me in the eyes like you're brazen, you're a brazen child, you're not, you're not humble, you're brazenly um, yeah, rude. So usually in the UK, you, you in the you, in the UK you don't look down. You look people in the eye. Years ago in the UK, many many uh, black and brown people, uh, if they were before the courts, got sent down. And part of what they did was using their body language, and that uh, they would say because the person was looking down, it was probably a sign of guilt. So they had to have training for the members of the judiciary and the court system to help them recognize that. Asians are like that as well. They tend to be humility, especially if someone who is older or someone with a higher status, like a judge, it's respectful to look down and not to look at them. In the UK, it's the opposite. Look people in the eye because that's a sign that you're not trying to, um, you're, you're honest. People see you as being honest. What you're talking about is the truth when you're looking them in the eye. But if you're looking away, they say you've got shifty eyes. That's another thing that people say. You've got shifty eyes if you're not looking at them in the, in the eye. Uh, and that's a negative. So just to remember that as well. When you're talking with colleagues, don't dominate the conversation. You know, watch out for how long you've been speaking compared to someone else. Because, you know, what? unfortunately, because we are often of a different skin tone and children, if you have children, I don't know who's on the call, but if you have children, uh, I know that my kids used to say that when they were younger and many, many, many people still say that till today, that if your child is the one or two black people in this school and they're on the, on the, in the, you know, during break time, they're playing together. You can be sure that nearly always, if anything kicks off, other children may do it, but it's a black person that's seen very quickly because you, I guess that's what they'll say. You stand out because your color, your skin tone is different, stands out. So it's important that when we we recognize that, so it's more it's more likely that other people may get away with something, but when we do it, then you may not get away with it. So avoid heated arguments as well. People in the UK, they tend to not be very keen on what they will call confrontation. So as much as possible, they avoid confrontation. And sometimes because we, for us, it's nothing. You're not saying it to be mean or nothing. You're just saying it as it is. And unfortunately, they may step back. You may, you may be in a workplace situation. You're five of you. The remaining four are white. They step back. They're not going to tell the land manager what the problem is. But you, you know, you're like, this is how we are in my country. We just pick our minds and then you go forward first more than everybody else or anybody else. 
Uh, that can be seen if you do it repeatedly. You can, it can be have a negative connotation because people here just would avoid confrontation. And even if they were going to say something, there's so many things I've learned about how they say it. If you're in the workplace and you want to give negative feedback that maybe somebody didn't do something, you may, and you're the line manager, you may start by saying something like, I know you've had a really busy week. Um, and I know that, you know, we, you, we, I thought you might have been able to finish this thing at such and such a time. In the Nigerian context, that's not how we would say, we say, I, I gave you this thing to do. This is now uh, two, two, uh, two days after you have not delivered it. But in the UK, if you are if you are managing people, you need to learn how to approach things like that. Um, so you 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 couch it. You know, you say, oh, you I know you you've really had a, a a terrible time recently, or I know things have been really hard for you. But do you think, or if you want to give somebody work for you to do, instead of saying do this now, get it on my table in two days time, you would say you'd even ask it as a question. Do you think, I mean, I have a line manager, and it's interesting. Whenever my line manager talks to me, he's even asked me today about. I'm supposed to have a one-to-one -one with him next week. And of course, if it's says, Nick, I can't do your one-to-one -one next week. That's it. It would be like, my line manager, I can't do it. But he asked it as a question. Is it okay if we're not able to do it? Because I now have to do a funeral. I hope that's okay. I'm like, of course it's okay. But you can see how they've said it. They've couched it more as a question, even though they're the person in authority, knowing that actually I can get to... I probably will still say yes. I mean, I'm not going to say no, but they couch it like that. So I'm already drifting into work. Have I got five more minutes? Is that what I've got? Or am I done? Um, um, no, no, you, you still got five minutes, ma. Uh, five, ten minutes. Oh, it's five, ten. Okay, fantastic. Yes. So this is workplace, you know, study, university, wherever you are. This uh, community, you can even say, but more workplace etiquette. What else, and I've started to talk about some of that actually, so you can you can pick up on that. Honestly, that egalitarian versus differential, our society is differential. We defer to people. There's a egalitarian. So forget the sir, forget the ma, forget the madam. If you're speaking to your Nigerian senior people in Nigerians, please keep doing that because you want to keep you know our culture is our culture. We value it, but actually their culture is different. And always respect diversity. You know, gender is really important. You respect people don't think because they're women. I don't, you know, different parts of Nigeria respond differently to women. But, you you know, gen people are seen as equal. Sexual orientation is really important that you recognize that in the workplace, that is also a thing that you're not, you're, 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 you're not supposed to infer anything negative about anybody's sexual orientation. They've not asked you, so just leave it be. That's not your, your thing to say. Leave it be. Respect people irrespective of their sexual orientation. Uh, even if you think, oh, I want to share my faith with them, it shouldn't be their orientation that's the first thing because you don't go to everybody else and ask their weakness or whatever you think is the problem with them and then say that's how you're going to approach sharing Jesus with them if that's what you want to do. Please respect that as well. Respect people's class as well. This is interesting. When you go out with your colleagues at work, right, you pay your own way. And I want to say, even if it's your birthday, I was still talking to someone about this yesterday and they're laughing their heads up. Even if it's your birthday and someone at work says, oh, should we go out for your birthday? They are the ones who have asked if you should go out for, if um, they want, if you should all go out together. Just make sure you've got your money in your pocket because they won't say because it's your birthday, they're all going to club together and pay for your own food. Everybody still pay for their food. And even to the extent where if you all order together, at the end, they will bring the receipt. Somebody will say, Yes, I was the one who ordered Coke. Uh, well, you, did you order a glass of wine? Yes. And everybody will be, you know, kind of working out what they've ordered and pay for just themselves. It's just how it is here. It's not like in Nigeria where people will say, oh, do you want to go out? And then that means that they're quite happy to for it to be their shout. It's not their shout. Even if they say it, it's not their shout. And in some workplaces, even on your birthday, they expect you to bring some goodies in. Like you are the one who's going to bring the cakes or little, you know, cupcakes. Some workplaces are like that. Please be aware of that as well. If that's what happens in your workplace, it's your choice if you don't want to do it. But I'll generally say, how much will it cost? It's good to kind of keep having that kind of rapport with people. Uh, um, it's like you're building a trust account so that if you want to ever share your faith with them, for example, you're already building a, a trust account with them. Um, if somebody gives you a lift, offer to pay towards the cost of petrol. Let them be the ones to turn it down, but don't assume and then not offer. Uh, it's important that you offer because that's just how it is here as well. You offer to pay. 
And then if you go for drinks with anybody, yes, you may choose that you only want to drink Fanta or you want to drink whatever it is that is your drink of choice or you want to have a, um, a virgin pina colada, something that doesn't have alcohol, whatever it is, that's your choice. But if anybody buys a round, that is, buys drinks for every one of you who's gone, you also should take your turn to buy for everybody else. And if you're not going to do that, the best thing is just not to get involved. And if they offer, just say, no, I don't want anything. But if you say yes and they buy your drink, they expect you to also buy a round for everybody else. Needless to say, we've talked about speaking quietly and I've talked to you about, you know, don't use commands. Instead, what you should use are requests. Um, this is interesting uh, about assertiveness, the difference between what they consider assertive and aggressive. And assertive is fine. Assertive, you can be, I mean, I don't know whether you do that sometimes. I sometimes just watch when people from the UK who have lived here, who are born here, who are generations here, when they express themselves assertively, they would not even raise their voice. I know people, when they're angry, they drop their voice. If, I don't know whether some of you have noticed that with white people. When they're actually angry, that's when they drop their voice so that you can never say that they were aggressive towards you. They would actually speak quieter. It's just that you know from the tone of what they're saying, you feel the pressure in the words that they're saying, but they drop their voices. So I want to encourage us all to try and learn these little, little things, you know, learn to drop your voice when you're when you're angry. Don't raise your voice when you're angry and then everybody will know that something is happening. Stand up for your view, express yourself, but don't disrespect other people's views. Um, so that's the whole thing about assertiveness. But aggress aggressiveness is, on the other hand, it disres disregards other people's views, it ignores other people's feelings. And what it means is that you may come across as being a bully, and then other, other people may feel humiliated. And that's when they go and talk to a, a line manager, because you raised your voice, uh, you made them feel small. You made them feel humiliated so they can take that to a line manager. And then it might come across that you're physically threatening, um, especially, again, I have to say, again, men, male to female, because male tend to, not all the time, feel, be bigger uh, in stature than female. And therefore, you may come across as being threatening. And all you think you're doing is you're gesticulating, but the person in front of you may just feel, ooh. And the other thing I wanted to say about the kind of... Um, the, the the your your personal space thing and I've done that if we were face to face I would have done that exercise with one of you if you if you stand if you notice if you stand close to someone just watch them if you're too close and you're invading their personal space they'll just give you a moment or two and they'll take a step back because that's what they're trying to show you is that you've you've invaded their personal space so you can come across as being aggressive if you're in someone's personal space and you're also gesticulating quite um quite a lot. If you're offered a cup of tea in the workplace, and I know this is really challenging because you may not like a cup of tea, but if you're always saying no to a cup of tea, cups of tea is more than a drink in the UK. It's a cultural norm. It's something that people gather around. Uh, it's something that is a space creating thing, a cup of tea. So I would say to you, try and if you're in the workplace and every time they say, do you want a cup of tea? You say no, 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 every time. They'll start to think, you're trying to signal that you don't want to be long in that space. And I have a story to tell about that if we had time, but I don't, we don't have time today. These are some of the things that um, Cups of Tea does. It creates social spaces, it's a place for bonding, it breaks silence, it helps in making friends. So if you're always saying no, find a drink that you like. If it's not a cup of tea, if it's herbal drink, if it's coffee, decaf, you know, there are lots of options. Uh, have Choose something that you like. And even if you don't want it all the time, from time to time, in that context of the workplace, say yes to a cup of tea. Uh, and then if, you, if, if you're giving a cup of tea, you've got to make time to make a cup of tea. You can't be the person who is on the receiving end of cups of tea from other people. You've also got to make. If you don't make, again, people will think you're being rude, that you just want to be served. In any case, Jesus taught us that it is more, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So we should be people who are willing to, to give. Scripture tells us that. Um, I just wanted, maybe I'll finish with this one. Um, this is about decoding workplace parlance, what people mean in the workplace. So if 
you know, and I know this. I remember when I was doing my PhD all those years ago, my uh, my supervisor, I said to them, I wanted to do a topic on idiom and they do idiomatic expressions. And they just said to me, oh, Nikkei, that's going to take you a while to get your data. And that's all they said. But actually, when I went to talk about that to some of my friends who'd been in the UK way longer than myself at that point, they said, ah, oh, Nikka, that means they're telling you you shouldn't do that topic. Or they will never say don't do it. All they'll find is one little way of just saying, hmm, that might take you a while to collect your data. Then you need to be the person who reads that comment well, rather than think you understand what they mean. Because me, I'm like, yeah, it would take me a while to collect my data. Yeah, I'll just go and collect it. I'll give myself more time. And they said, no, what they're saying is that. And truly, when I went back with a different topic, the first thing my supervisor said was, oh, I like that. Oh, that's a good one. You know, effectively, that one you brought me the other time, I didn't think it was a great one. I mean, it's a great topic to research, but he was just telling me to take me a lot of time. So here are some examples. If you're talking, if a British person says to you with the greatest respect, they don't mean they're respecting you. They mean they're about to tell you that what you said was not a good idea. It's another way of saying that that thing you said was a little bit stupid. So if you hear anybody say to you with the greatest respect, just know that what they're trying to tell you is not with respect to you, is that actually what you've just said is not uh, the best thing. If they said, mm, that's very interesting, it doesn't mean they're impressed. It means mm, it might be. It's not that it is. So again, you need to be able to decode that in the workplace that if you're Land manager said, that's interesting. They're probably trying to say it's interesting, but, and then they're going to counter it with something else. If a British person says to you, I'll bear that in mind, they may mean it, but they're more likely to mean, uh, I'm probably not, I'm, I'm not going to go with that. I'm just wanting to say something back to you that makes you not feel too bad. Uh, uh, so I'll bear that in mind. Uh, and if they say that's quite good, quite is not an intensifier that means it's better. And many of us use quite in that way, actually. We use quite to mean, oh, it's better than good. It's, you know, it's, it's better. No, actually, quite does the opposite. It takes away from the good. So it's like, uh, it, it, we think they're saying it's better than good. No, they're actually saying it could be better. So don't say, oh, that's quite when you mean, when you don't mean it's very good. Uh, when we use it often to mean it's good, it's better than good, but actually it's not true. Um, another thing that they might say is this is a very brave proposal. So that would be something that maybe my lama and my supervisor could have said to me all those years ago. Oh, idiomatic expressions, expressions, that's really brave. In other words, that's going to take a lot of work to, to get that. So that means it's insane, not that it's good. And if they say, well, that's not bad, <laughs> they don't really mean that that's good. <laughs> They're actually saying that actually that's poor. And this is the last bit of that. So if somebody else says, if you say so, <laughs> it doesn't mean that your view is right. It means actually they're disagreeing with you. Uh, and of course, you've heard the expression, that is an idiom, what I wanted to explore before with my PhD. Uh, I'm in a bit of a pickle. Uh, it's not that I have minor difficulties, it's that things are really bad. It, you know, the British are known for something called being understated. They understate things. So I'm in a bit of a pickle. Actually, that means things are really, really bad for me right now. Um, but they won't say that. Uh, they're a bit like some Christians who don't like to say negative things. So you can maybe see them like that sometimes. And, and if they say to you, for example, could we consider some other options? Actually, it means that they don't like what you've said. So it's their good, it's their, their polite way of saying that. Um, and uh, sorry, I think you might have dropped something means you have definitely dropped something. So when they think, I think you might, it's actually that you have. Um, and if someone says, excuse me, someone's sitting here, it's not a genuine inquiry. They're telling you to move your things. Maybe you've put your chair, your bag on the seat next to you on the bus or something. And if, if you ask someone, how are you? And they said, I felt better. It means that they're really feeling horrible. So I think I'll stop there because I think I've run out of my time. So we, I, I, I did say we might not be able to do table manners. So I'll stop sharing now. Yeah. There are so many things that you mentioned there that I know that I definitely went through, you know, like things like um, saying sorry, because in our culture, you know, each time maybe someone falls or someone hurts themselves, you say, Belle. and I just got used to saying that every time I was with my friends or with my colleagues, and they'll always say, why, why are you saying sorry to me? You know, you, you, didn't, you didn't hurt me, so why are you saying it? So they felt strange me saying that, but... I always try to explain to them that, oh, sorry, my culture, this is how it is. But they just find it very, very, very weird when I say that. And 
I know also things like, you know, addressing people. I remember again, growing up when I had my first job, I was calling my boss, sir. And he called me and said, James, you know, I would like you never to call me that name again, please. <laughs> Just call me by my first name. And this person was like in his 60s. He's old enough to be my father. And I was like, how can I call you by your first name? And so, and I think it's really good that, you know, we we we, we get to understand that we're in a different culture and, you know, we need to um, understand the norms and, you know, the, the the different ways that they do things here, you know, doing eye contact again, that is a very, very important thing that you've mentioned, Ma, where, you know, I've been in trouble for not looking at the teacher in the eye, whereas I saw that as a respect and she saw that as, as being rude, <laughs> you know, so there's so many things. So thank you so much um, for, for that, Ma. We have a few questions on the, on the chat box, please, if you have any questions, please, uh, you can just put it on the chat whilst we just go through this question. And so my, the first question that we have on here is, what if in a situation uh, you greet your colleague and she doesn't respond, like it happens all the time? Do you still keep greeting or do you just see her and ignore her? Thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, if it's a colleague and they, you greet them and you greet them and they don't answer you, um, as a child of God, I will keep my heart really soft. So I, I, will, I will stop greeting them, but I won't hold it against them because that's really just their culture. Uh, it, it, it depends. The British culture is like that, that you don't have to greet. Greeting is not like a thing to them. Somebody might see you not greet you now at work and then they need to have a conversation with you. They'll still come and have a conversation with you. They won't think, you know, but I remember when I was young, once I went to see one of my aunties uh, and I walked past a, a man who was in his garden sitting in a chair and I just walked past him and I was on my way to my aunt and I went and, my, and, um, and then, well, I couldn't find my way. So I came back. And then greeted him to ask him. He said, eh, Shabi, you were the one who walked past just now, you know, a few minutes ago. You didn't greet me then. It's now that you know how to greet me. So in our culture, even meeting people, our languages have greetings for all sorts of things. You know, if you're Yoruba, eku joko, eku juro, eku, you know, everything on earth has a greeting. And so it is for many of the other languages in Nigeria. But in the UK, you don't have greetings for that. Nobody says greeting standing you know greetings for sitting down there's no such greeting because greeting isn't a thing for them they'll greet you if they need to talk to you so if i was that person obviously because it's not our culture we will feel a little bit bad that ah, why am i greeting you you're not even greeting me back but keep your heart soft because recognize that it's their culture if that person needs something from you they'll probably come to you and say hello can you help me you know da, da, da. but if they don't need anything they probably just don't see it as a thing so that would be the the best case scenario now the worst case scenario is that this person may really just not like you or whatever and praise the lord you are a child of god you you know your worth your worth is not dependent on someone in the workplace you know talking to you anything so let your worth you know your worth let your worth be based on the fact that you know the child of who you are and so if they don't greet you and you've tried your best leave them alone and if they come and greet you again next time because they want something from you don't be like that so nigerian man i told you about who said hey shabby you're the one who walked past and you didn't greet me it's the culture that's just how it is i hope that's helpful whoever asked that question i'm, I'm sure it is thank you very much ma for 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 that answer um i think the same person that asked another question to say how do you address your boss like your manager uh, or your deputy manager at work at at the workplace do you address them by their names like other staff do you, or can you say sir or madam well i'm going to let you answer that question because you answered it <laughs> <laughs> um, okay I'll, I'll try my best i think uh, for me um growing up in this country i've try to to uh, to basically adapt to whatever environment I'm in so again and this is what I, I think that's one of the things that you also brought up and uh, the fact that obviously we're in a culture however you also have your own culture so I'll use an example of in a place of work and um, we all call each other by first names 
Um, so you then calling someone sir sounds very odd um, compared to everyone else. So you just have to just <laughs> you just have to just get used to calling you know your boss by their first names. However, I've also been in a certain actually my current company where um, some of my colleagues he actually says sir to to the boss and the boss is happy with it. So, you know, there are, there are different scenarios, which I would say definitely look at the scenario you're in and, you know, apply whatever you think would be uh, useful for that scenario. I'll divert it again to a church setting, for example. If I was in a, a an African church and I know that the culture there is all about respect and you know, you know, saying sirs and uncles and aunties, then by all means, this is my culture as well. So I wouldn't say because I'm in the United Kingdom. So, you know, now I'm going to call you by your name because, you know, that's the culture in the country. I would also respect the fact that in your culture, you know, this is what you require. And I don't see any issue with actually just calling someone, you know, either sir or ma, or uncle, auntie. Uh, whereas, like, I've been in in churches where there are mixed cultures, so white and blacks. And again, the same scenario where the white people, they tend to want you to call them by their names. If that's the case, I do that. And then if the black people decide this is what, how you, I want you to address me, I do that. And um, so that is the, my my own perspective of how I handle things in this country. Thank you. That's excellent. My hand is raised. Um, yes, please, please ask your question. So it's not a question. It's just an addition to what you've said. So sometimes there are some bosses that like humor. So when you call them, yes, boss, yes, sir, they just it's just a sense of humor. So if you study the workplace and some some people, your boss likes that kind of uh, humor, you can apply that. Secondly, if you're if you see somebody, your church member in the in in your workplace, and they are not the they are not the boss. Let's say you see a respectful mother in your church that is is not the chief nurse in in a care home, and then you go there and you say, "Ma, you may put her in trouble because she's not the lead." And in this country, the person who they say ma to may be the queen, the queen of England or the, the somebody very high. They don't cut seat to any person except those in the royal family. So if you go to work in a, in a hospital, you not see your church member who is not at the top and you say, um, good evening, ma, you may put that person in trouble. So it's good to know separate church or um what you would do normally in the church setting from the workplace. You may be tempted to say, oh, I've always said ma to this person in church. So in this workplace, I'll say ma, you may put that person in trouble. So it's all about understanding what's acceptable in your organization. If I may add something to that, the, um, I did uh, my PhD in the end. Uh, I taught. I taught about. Ter um, I, I investigated terms of address, and there's something called no naming as part of a term of address. So I would say that in that context that we've just heard described in the workplace, you can choose. You can choose no naming. So this person that you normally would not call by, because it will feel strange if there's somebody who is like. At a church, maybe they're like 20 years older than you, 25 years older than you, and you're in the workplace. You don't really want to call them by their names in the workplace because that's your, from your culture, you don't want to call them. But you can use something called no naming. And that's a, that is you choose not to name them in the front, in front of other people so that you don't have that kind of lack of, you know, that uncomfortable thing. You just don't name them. Um, you greet them. But then when you're by yourselves, you obviously can revert back to, even in the workplace, place when you're by yourself you can revert to what you normally would use in the workplace yeah wonderful thank you very much i think we have a hand being raised um lawn emmanuel yeah it's just an addition it's not a question oh okay just, thank you uh, what happened um, sometime when i started to work in this country as a nurse um 
there is one Indian lady. Uh, she normally call our boss sister, sister Anne, sister Anne. And then we were in a meeting and she wanted to ask a question or something and she just said, sister Anne. And the lady was so, so much annoyed. But because of my own background, you know, in nursing, you have sister, we call sister so 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 in that's before the name especially if they are older if they are a senior colleague so we just don't call Anne or Mary we put sister just like a kind of a respect the, this day I don't know I can't I can't explain what happened to her she's been saying sister Anne but she just got annoyed I had to intervene and say no Anne it's, 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 it's the bag. Look, this lady just started work and she was just shaking. I said, no, it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's a kind of respect, please. Um, she, she, the, the same in Africa. You know, when you are a senior colleague, we put sister in front and then she just calmed down. And I later, I went to uh, uh, Anne and explained to her that she won't, she won't put sister. She's a kind of, a kind of respect. So then she understood. She was like, how can she be calling me sister like a Catholic or something in a workplace? So, so we need to understand some things. I just started work, but I know that in this country, you don't put sister, auntie, whatever. Just call the name. It's not offended. Even my pastor, you see this much more, when we were in, in, in one of these, um, white people church. You see small children, they just call the pastor Mike, and I will look like what she call it. Then I remember we are in uh, we are in UK. You know, calling the pastor, you can't even put Pastor Mike. He said, Oh Mike, and my my body will shake. So oh <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, thank Sister Lau. By the way, I know Sister Lau. Thank you. God bless you for your. Yeah, God bless you, my dear <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I think we we'll go just... back a long way. <laughs> oh, ask <laughs> Um, I think we we'll just take one more question, just because of our time. Um, but um, iPhone two. I I don't know who you are. Do you want yeah. to? Yeah, it's me, it's, uh, Agnes. Oh, hello. Sister from Kojeku. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just want to add to the area of Sa. Uh, there was a day we were having some team meetings and there were these big men, you know, the professors, the consultants from the hospital. And when I wanted to give my own report, I just say, sir, he got upset. He actually left the meeting. So I was like, what have I done wrong? Then my register manager was like, because she's a Nigerian as well, she said, oh, I don't know what's going on. So later he came back to tell us that is said, uh, maybe somebody who cannot perform or something. Maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe our lecturer can tell us what's the meaning of star in this country that some people don't want to be called star. He was really, really, really upset that I called him star. I said, well, sir? I said, I'm talking to you, sir. He said, sir, he just log off. Yeah. Is there any interpretation to I, that? I, yeah. I, I mean, I can have a go at uh, answer that question in terms of what is. So, thank you for that question. Um, I think sometimes we even don't recognize that. You remember that there are some people during the coronation who were so against the royal family that they were saying, "Not my king." So the, the, we have uh -huh. Republicans. Yeah, we have Republicans in the UK who really do not like the idea of a monarchy at all. They don't like so that egalitarianness that I talked to you about. Some people is really ingrained in them, especially the further up north you go. Uh, in Yorkshire, for example, years ago, we used to be called the Social Republic of, uh, of South Yorkshire because uh, you know what that means, socialists who really feel everybody is exactly the same. So it may be that that person is like, why are you giving me that kind of honor of being a star? I mean, I really am not. And some people are really, really against it. Uh, but for us, it's a, it's a term of respect. But always remember, this is not a deferential society. People don't defer in this country. 
they only have a limited number of people they defer to, and everybody knows who they are. They're the royal family. They don't defer to anybody else. They don't defer on age. You can be talking to a person who is 90 something, a child of two will still call them by name. And uh, a child of four, because a child of two may not speak yet. Um, but, and, and you don't differ by status. All we do is an egalitarian. Everybody is on the same level, supposedly. That's how it works. So, Yeah, my, my daughter-in-law calls me Agnes. Hmm. <laughs> and that's the wife of my first son. And I'm used to it. <laughs> yeah, but, and I know some people who, who would say, before anything gets too serious, I don't want you to call me Agnes. I'm mommy. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are different. Some families, they accept it. Other families, and other families, I've heard people who accept it for a while, uh, who, sorry, who the, the in-laws start saying, okay, mommy, mommy, and then one happened to one of my friends. And then after several years of the marriage, the young man started calling her by her first name. And she said, what? Why, why are you yeah. doing this? We've been always saying mommy, mommy. And he said, yeah, but I thought I now know you well enough. So you can never know me well enough to start calling me by my first name. You, oh, I'm always mommy. So yeah, these are things that we uh, have to do. Yeah, yeah, she called me mommy daughter when they first got married. Daughter, mm. mommy daughter, mommy daughter. For later when she's upset, she's like Agnes, mm. your son, Agnes. <laughs> thank you anyway. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So because of time, we'll just wrap up. Um, Ravatai, are you online? Uh, yes, please. All right. Thank you so much, Ma, for the time spent with us tonight. Um, I believe everyone will agree with me that there's absolutely so, 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 so much to learn. There's so, so much to learn. And I'm tempted to say that we might consider, you know, having another version of this, you know, so that you'd expose us more to some of these things. Thank you so very much. I'd like us to just take a minute to pray for our speaker tonight. She has blessed us. She has given to us out of the abundance of what she knows. I'd like us to just say a word of prayer for her. I'd like us to just, you know, bless her back, give back to her. Let's pray that God will refill her out of the graces that she has, you know, blessed us with this night. Our God will refill her. Bless her the more in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'd like to just take a minute to just uh uh give I'd like to give everyone the opportunity to, you know, give of the abundance that God has given to them tonight. Uh, and this is the time where I would call for tithes and offering. So please, I would like the technicals to please kindly project the account number of the church. And uh, I would like us to give from the abundance of what God has given to us. All right. So whilst we're doing that, uh, the only announcement, uh, but we've got tonight is about Sunday service. Please, uh, Sunday service holds by 10 o'clock. Uh, workers' prayer starts by 9.30. So please do well to come up, come early to church on Sunday. And, uh, you know, God will bless you as you do that. All right. So in closing, I'll just quickly take the closing prayer. All right. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for the time that was spent in your presence today. Father, we thank you for the time of fellowshipping together with one another. Thank you for all that we have learned tonight. Thank you for what you have exposed us to tonight. Father, we pray that you would help us to, you know, keep practicing these things, help us to understand what we've learned, and also help us to apply them appropriately in our personal lives, in our workplace, in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, we ask that you also help us to know uh, how to apply these things, how to apply them in the right context, in the right environment, to the right people. Very important. We help us to apply these things correctly in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that we go to bed tonight, that you grant us a sweet and refreshing sleep, that we all wake up tomorrow refreshed, strengthened in the name of Jesus. Thank you for answers to prayers. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. All right. So I'd like us to say the grace in fellowship together. If you can, please kindly unmute your mic and let's take the grace in fellowship together. Grace, 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 grace,
God bless you. God bless Bye. you. Thank you, everybody, Bye. for Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. God bless Bye. you. Bless you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thank Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.